Okay. Well, Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Bibliomancy for Beginners. Remember when we did this thing? It's been a month. This is literally a month late. Um, I'm losing my voice. Sometimes Google Hangouts decides I'm not allowed to have a voice, even when it is vaguely there. This is going to be a shit show. In general. Also, this there will be like swearing. Bibliomancy for beginners, the emphasis on for beginners. Not of <laughs> book club, but just of the mind. Beginners of the mind. Oh, no. Um, disclaimer, we all read this book about a month ago. Yeah. So, there will be moments where we're like, did that happen? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Wide-reaching knowledge, but not as many specifics. <laughs> No. Um, Taylor and I did read some wikis before this, so yes. <laughs> I still stand by my summary. <laughs> basically, the three summary? of us are just too many words. Oh, no. yeah. I'm gonna save my summary for my overall impression. I see, but yeah, Michaela, Greek names are hard to remember. Mm-hmm. I know that the, the main lady was Desdemona, right? Des yeah. Desdemona. And there there Desdemona was a guy named Lefty. Lefty. Yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> Doing it. <laughs> um, anyway, if you haven't guessed by the title of this and us talking about this, we are going to be discussing Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. Uh, this is the first in a series of hangouts where we will be discussing books by authors we have already read as a book club. Uh, the very first season of Bibliomancy for Beginners, we read The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey oh Eugenides. God, really? Yeah, it was like yep, book that was, four. That was the first, yeah. Oh my I think god. it was five. Yeah, it would have been five because we had Rachel yeah. then, and that was Michaela. Yes. Yeah. Weird Rachel. Yeah. Back. Shout out to oh. Rachel. Who's... Back in 2010, we had Rachel and... 2013. 2013. 2013. <laughs> May 21st. <laughs> May 21st, 2013, to be exact. <laughs> the very first episode of Bibliomancy for Beginners happened. So yeah, it's been, can... been a while. It's been... I started saying the thing, you know, like, well, back in, you know, 20,000, whatever, we had cash, we had jobs. I'm like, yep, we had a lot more dick back in 2013. <laughs> oh, no. Um, it's funny, because Rachel's last name is Dick. <laughs> that that, that who... was the entire joke. <laughs> Who, who didn't get the joke because that, that Rachel isn't just here. Being, that wasn't me being mean to her. <laughs> the, and, and it wasn't us being like, yeah, we had sex in 2013, because that could have also been a connotation. <laughs> a lot more dick was had. <laughs> this is, yep, so this is going to be how the on. Um... This is a book club wherein we talk about the characters and events of the novels, but we do always start with our spoiler-free overall reviews, so if you have not read Middlesex and you do not wish to be spoiled, there will be a point where I will say, you shall leave now, but stay for a little while. If you have not heard of this book before, uh, kind of surprising, why did you click on this video? Here is the Goodreads description, because none of us have a physical copy of the book with us at the moment. Yours is down the hall, Michaela. It, it's upstairs. It's up, It's literally upstairs. I'm not going upstairs. Might as well be in If she UConn. leaves to go upstairs, she might come back and there might not be audio. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm just not trusting anything. So Middlesex tells the breathtaking story of Calliope Stephanides. Calliope. Stephanides? God. Calliope. That's true. It is. Stephanides. Greek. And yeah. three generations... Stephanides, I did that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and three generations of the Greek-American Stephanides family who travel from a tiny village overlooking Mount Olympus in Asia Minor to Prohibition-era Detroit, witnessing its glory days as the Motor City and the race riots of 1967 before moving out to the tree-lined streets of suburban Gross Point, Michigan to understand why Calliope is Calliope. I'm going to say Calliope because like it's... 
Like the carnival <laughs> organ. Oh, that's true. Like the carnival <laughs> organ. <laughs> oh, God. Taylor. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a month, okay? We clearly uh, are much happy to be together and talking about IP. books. It's not like other girls. She has to uncover a guilty family secret and the astonishing genetic history that turns Callie into Cal, one of the most audacious and wondrous narrators in contemporary fiction. Lyrical and thrilling, Middlesex is an exhilarating reinvention of the American epic. Did they literally use the word exhilarating to describe this novel? That is the biggest lie I've ever heard. Can we also exhilarating be- reinvention. Can we also draw attention to this might be one of the only, like, one of the five times in history where someone says, I'm not like other girls, and they're actually correct. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. There it is. There it is. Um... Do we need to introduce ourselves at this point? I've been skipping over it the last couple of times because people should really know who we are. I mean, Michaela, if they watch Gretchen, the YouTube Taylor. channel, they know that there's Michaela, Gretchen, and not either of those two. So. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> Alternating Taylor. between two different cups of tea. And I also in the woods. That's all you need to know. Are you sitting on one of those terrible plastic green lawn chairs? Yeah. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Uh, Gretchen, what was your overall impression of Middlesex so that we can get the I hated it out of the way? (laughs) Um, As is usual when we read books that are long and boring, uh, Taylor and Michaela really liked it, and I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very hyperbolic throughout this because I don't remember enough of the actual specific reasons I hated it to be able to bring up evidence, so I'm just going to be really mean and sassy. I don't know why I hated it, so I'm just going to yell. <laughs> exactly, I'm an American. Wow, get you on uh, Fox News, sing. I, I will say that I really appreciated the depth of this story and the story that it was trying to tell, um... I did really enjoy that. I just felt that the scope of it felt slightly unnecessary. And I also just... It was it was just boring. I My favorite part of this book was when it ended because it meant that I made it all the way through. Reading it was a slog. And the first half of it I didn't care about. So I appreciated so I- the thematics... But otherwise, I didn't care. So I'm going to add a thing, since this is the first time that we're... Well, aside from The Magicians, this is the first time that we are reading a book that we've read another book of. Did you like The Virgin Suicides better than this one, thinking back four years? <laughs> um, yes. Wouldn't only be three? Well, this is season four. This is season four. Okay. She's thinking really Gretchen? hard. Oh no, she's gone. <laughs> I thought God damn it. And emotion. Gretchen, could you start your answer Gretchen, over again? you left us. Yeah. <laughs> nope, she's still gone. Gretchen. <laughs> wow. What would a book club be without just ten minutes of well, stop working. <laughs> We need to all live together because it will fix all of the problems. So, do you want to go next, or I think we should? Just I mean, keep I it. can. Okay, what, what I, I will. I liked it. Okay. Uh, a lot more than Gretchen did. I think that I liked the Virgin Suicides better from a story perspective, and the things that it was trying to do with storytelling the whole communal narrative thing of the Virgin Suicides, I liked a lot more than I liked this sort of long scoping generational thing. That being said, I did really enjoy sort of the way that this was like watching 
not the downfall, but like the unraveling of this family in a way, leading all the way up to how things got awkward. <laughs> I wouldn't even call it an unraveling because I don't think they fail, but it is very much the Greek tragedy. Yeah. Oh, In, she's completely gone. Yeah. Bye, Gretchen. Both, both structurally a Greek tragedy. And, you know, like, incest is a major player. Such Greek. It, I, I really Greek. liked all the Greek influence in it, but many of the things were, like, you know, obvious just because it's a Greek family and all those histories, but then just... Uh, how Eugenides draws in so many of those elements. I loved how it kept returning to Tiresias because I think that was a really effective um, way to work with the theme. And especially to deal with like a, what has been historically one of the trickiest things to navigate. Like just not operating within... Incest? No, no, no. Um, the... Um, the hermaphroditic existence. Now oh. that doesn't really fit into most um, interactions and all of that. Gretchen has um, no no internet. <laughs> no internet. Okay, so Gretchen I has think we can... no internet. Yeah. But uh, I guess I'll save what I was starting to get into until a little later, I suppose, until Gretchen's here to complain about it. Um, but I would like to say, I I also really enjoyed this, uh, as you. Um, I definitely liked it more than Gretchen did. Um, and I actually also say, I liked it more than Virgin Suicides. Really? Yes. Uh, for me, <laughs> the story was much more engaging. I'm not, I'm not acknowledging your appearance, Gretchen. Okay. You interrupted my sentence <laughs> with your, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Uh, so yeah, and while I think Virgin Suicides was definitely a great book, um, another thing I can't go back to the Virgin Suicides without getting really sad because it's always the same book. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't get better, which is both a testament to the book and you know, a personal preference. Uh, but. I also found I liked the narration in this a lot more. I think it, it, it was funny, it was heartfelt, and it kept like a lot of the more abstract, distant elements of it in a very personal sort of narrative voice. So, so what I missed was Taylor being wrong again. All right. Oh, are you calling Michaela wrong, too? Oh, did she also like Middlesex better than the Virgin Suicides? No. But no, she I said I liked for Virgin Suicides about the book. She just oh, destroyed your internet. Didn't, we didn't get to hear why you liked the Virgin Suicides better, though, because you just appeared, so if you would yeah. like to explain... I think, like, the basic reason is that I didn't feel anything but boredom and why goddess is not ending when I was reading Middlesex, but the version of Suicides was like this. I felt so many things, and so it's not a book that I would want to read, like, again and again and again, but I was just, like, so impacted by that novel. And I felt like it was much more tighter, more emotionally salient, mm -hmm. um, and just... Um, said more of what it had to say in more productive ways, uh, as opposed to this book, which had a lot to say, but just kind of went on and on and on and on. <laughs> and it didn't really hit me in any, like, it was, like... It's almost it was like it was long good. enough to track 60 years of history. Yeah, but it shouldn't have been. Why would you do that? It was unnecessary. Because if you just say... Oh, I have this genetic defect because. Okay, sure, it would have been a logical tank book, but it would have been a hundred pages, and no one really would have cared. 
I just like I felt like this book was I think in the description it said like an exhilarating new like a great American novel, and I really just felt like this book was like you know what would be a great American epic spanning sixty years of immigration in Detroit and the predator, which is like I okay. I think it's actually more interesting because it takes the great American novel of like becoming a new person and applies that to something that's entirely rejected in that American society. I guess it's just because Callie and Cal's story was the only one I cared about, and I had to slog through over half the novel to get there. But you couldn't make any of that meaningful without the context. I disagree. It would have been incredibly shallow, and it would have been done. So what we have learned today, children, is that Taylor and Gretchen disagree. <laughs> I think now would be a good time to switch over into the spoilery section and stop dancing around stuff. Um, yes, so there will be spoilers. If you don't want to be spoiled, you can flee. Choose to read the book or not. Choose to side with Taylor. Choose to side with Gretchen. Choose to side with me in the middle. In the, I mean, it was an okay book, but... I liked other books better. <laughs> Who do you choose to side with? You need to you need to pick. Actually, you know what? YouTube has a poll feature now, so I could maybe add a poll feature to this. Or Every can week, to side. Who, do you side with? <laughs> Who do you side with? Um, um, Michaela, we don't have time for any of your middle-of-the-road politics. Whenever we discuss a book, it is the center of the universe. It is either the greatest or worst thing. Okay. And Gretchen and I embrace that. <laughs> Maybe I just like telling you you're wrong. Have you ever considered that? Yeah, because mm. otherwise it's boring. <laughs> it's literally why you keep me here. <laughs> Michaela and I know this. It is boring when it's just the two of us. <laughs> it's just also um, so much more positive, and that's boring. <laughs> bring in the negativity. Like, I really appreciate your opinion. Mm-hmm. We do. That's why we have this. And yeah. Well, I like Michaela. Anyway. I don't like you. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if we can start with favorite parts, because this doesn't seem like a book where you can be like, yeah, this scene. I guess you could. Does anybody have a particularly favorite scene? Gretchen's favorite part is when it ended. When it ended. <laughs> this group Are the going... This uh, these like two thirty somethings, or no three, are going down in like those tiny little pedal paddle boats. Like, oh you no! Know, just three abreast. You know, one dude's drinking a beer. They're kind of paddling down the pond, and then behind them is there's this little string, and then a tiny little floating raft with another girl just sitting in it, <laughs> <laughs> and she's also in her thirties. <laughs> She's just, she just rejected down the pond. <laughs> <laughs> They're just pulling her along? What is this? Yeah. She's not doing any of the work. Anyway, what were we talking about? Your favorite part of the book. Yeah, do you have a favorite of... scene? Um, it's hard to bring it down to a scene. I would definitely break it into the, the chunks of whose story is being told. I think what stuck with me the most as being one of the most interesting parts was when Calliope was actually working in that strip club in like the, the mermaid's grotto and I think just her kind of self reflection in that space was actually really interesting because it's simultaneously saying this sex work was like terrible but because I didn't actually acknowledge anyone, I actually found this to be a really, gro like, a an experience for growth. And I'm like, that's a really complicated, not even, you know, like, body positivity. It's just like, you're like, this was shitty. It was awful. I got through it through drugs and alcohol. But then it was also really kind of productive. <laughs> Realism in the sex industry. <laughs> It was shitty, but it was productive. <laughs> I 
think it was also um, just really interestingly described. Well, go on. I don't... I honestly don't think that I have a particular scene that is my favorite. I might have had one, like, a month ago when this was fresher in my mind, <laughs> but I'm, like, way more into, like, I, I know the overarching plot of this story and less of, oh, yeah, you guys remember when this thing happened? I, I, I don't. Taylor I remember remembers. when that thing happened. Um, the only scene that I can remember really vividly is like way from the beginning of the book when uh, Desdemona has the sex dream about her brother because it made me uncomfortable. And that's not my favorite scene at all. I just remember being extremely uncomfortable because that was before the point where we were like, oh, okay, they're going to fall in love. Oh, it was just you... like... <laughs> can we then have a segment of... Scenes that made us the most uncomfortable, because I've got one, too. <laughs> go, go ahead. What, what was it? Um, stif- uh, Calliope's parents with the clarinet <laughs> scenes. That's fair. She's like, That's, let yeah. me put this on your knee. And like, oh, maybe you should put it on my stem. And he's like, <laughs> clarinet noise. <laughs> <laughs> That was awkward in a different way, though, I think. <laughs> that was just, like, really uncomfortable sex scene. Mine was like, why are you having this dream? I don't... That's... Mm. At least she didn't, like... That's, you know, that's all just Freud's domain, but, like, she didn't choose to have that dream. They chose a clarinet. Robo. <laughs> I just, so many things about, like, how it's described, about how they're, like, this brother and sister finally having sex, and then they're, like, in the rowboat, and everything's so awkward, and I'm just, like, oh, my God. And then it's later <laughs> described as, like, the best part of their, like, marriage, and I'm, like, oh, boy. <laughs> the honeymoon. Okay, so here is here is the question then, because this was something that I was thinking out about throughout this book. Were we uncomfortable because of our predisposed notions towards incest, or were the scenes actually written to make us uncomfortable? See, I had no problem with Desdemona and Lefty at any point in the story, so I definitely think it, the clarinet was supposed to make us uncomfortable. <laughs> so the boat then, didn't bother me. It, it, it was... <laughs> well, no, because, like, once it started happening, all I could think of was I just kept making Lannister jokes. So, like... <laughs> and you didn't enjoy yourself? Yeah. <laughs> no. Because, like, I mean, there's a whole... I think it was really, really interesting how it was written. And I mean, because, like I said, I didn't enjoy a particular part of this book, but I did find a lot of the concepts interesting about, like, the whole swing from, like, them falling in love to Desdemona all of a sudden being like, you're never gonna sleep with me again because I'm so freaked out. Um, like, and how that changed their marriage and changed them. I thought that was all really interesting and really well done. Um, but I mean, I think, like, what, what you said with that one scene in the beginning of just, like, is this really happening right now? Like, yeah. what is, what is, okay. All right, all right, no, we're really going there. Okay. Yep. <laughs> buckled in, I'm buckled in, ready for the ride. <laughs> yeah. So, there is, I had issues, I think for me, I had issues believing that Desdemona and Lefty were falling in love at the beginning. It seemed a little bit forced to me, but then at the same time, I saw that there was nobody else for them for each other, so that I I eventually accepted it, and then for the rest of the book was pretty much okay with everything mm-hmm. that was happening. But I I wasn't sure whether it was the writing style or my predisposed notion of like that shouldn't be happening and it is happening. So is it like? Mm-hmm. I think there was in definitely my mind. something in the writing though too, because they were both uncomfortable with it happening. They were trying to stop it from happening. And then there's the way that they were always really conscious of how it was going to be perceived. Like, the whole mm-hmm. ritual of, like, meeting each other on the boat on the way to America and going through that. Like, there was always... They were always uncomfortable as individual people with mm-hmm. it as well. So you add that into the layer of it being incest, of it being very awkwardly described. And there's just, like, so many angles for uncomfortability. 
and then they spent their entire time in America hiding from each other. So I, I found it to be, even if we say, okay, maybe I didn't believe it, which, I you know, that, that sounds a personal preference. I think Eugenides was incredibly thorough on tracking the the mental states yeah. involved. I think the other thing is, the thing that makes Desdemona uncomfortable again with the relationship she has with her brother was finding out that there could be birth defects yeah. due to incest. So sh it wasn't... It was like, oh, there's a reason for the, the cultural things that we were being affected by mm -hmm. originally, where we knew we weren't supposed to be doing this, but there wasn't a reason why we weren't supposed to be doing this. It was just wrong considered by the culture. But now there's like, mm -hmm. oh, there's like a medical reason why we shouldn't be doing this. And that lets her latch back onto it's a cursed idea. She's like, yeah. yeah. It really is. You know, I also really... I, I think Desdemona for me was a, was my favorite character in a way yeah. because she, she okay you agree with me on that well too? I because she no I totally she wasn't mine but I totally see where you're coming from where like she had some of the most interesting like not interesting in the way Calliope's story was interesting because that was interesting mm -hmm. from a, I haven't experienced this and I, I would like to learn more about what it's like to, to be raised one way but then identify another way and how I come to that point. Desdemona's yeah. story was much more a story of like self growth in a similar way of like understanding yourself and whether or not the things that you want are true and that paired with her beliefs was like a super interesting arc for me. I like. She also story. bears the it brunt kind of, of the the Greek tragedy that we were discussing before, like yeah. a lot more than Calliope, I think. Because yeah. Calliope, you know, grows beyond that, and you know, like becomes what she's supposed to be. Desdemona never, never gets mm -hmm. that happiness, and I actually found no. the 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 scene between her and Calliope at the end when Calliope's like, I'm your granddaughter, don't you remember me? And she's like, I don't remember having one of those. It's like, yes, you do, you do. But I, I'm i getting blank <laughs> stares. Do you guys not remember this scene? But, and graphic has gone. <laughs> oh. I didn't That's remember lucky. that scene, which seems like a scene I should remember. because That's like a super I, important scene. Yeah. Um, I, I vaguely remember there being that happening. I just don't remember the specific. It's, when, it's the very, very end when uh, yeah. her family's at her father's funeral. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yep. And then she's going to be guarding the door, which was also... Like, I found that whole end thing to be phenomenal because you get to go back to that element of the, the man guarding the house... And Kali Cal got to do that. So they don't come back in with the doors open. I, I think it was gorgeously written. I think thematically it was very tight. And that scene with Desdemona was just very sad and, and pretty. But I liked a lot of this book. And I think a lot of it stuck in my head more than you guys over this month. Which isn't meant to be a slight. I haven't been reading as many books, I don't think, in that span. But, uh, That's true. Also you also liked it more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like From I was more willing to discard it to read other things. Mm -hmm. Also, and the scene even with oh, go on. Even I was just gonna say, even though I did like it, it was more of a three star book for me, and I my mm -hmm. three star books tend to very quickly leave my head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. I read it at two. I didn't read it one. <laughs> I, I, so I just she, it to, wasn't yeah. utter garbage. <laughs> I guess the sentences actually formed paragraphs. And, uh. but the the other scene I wanted to mention was um, when her dad's on the bridge and he's just like zooming off it to crash into the water. I love how she steps in to kind of take control of history and be like, "This is this is what actually happened." And it's just describing this gorgeous thing. Hmm. I don't. I'm not going to describe it scene like line for line because obviously I would come up very short. But just 
that that scene probably broke my heart most in the book, which was very strange because her dad was also like one of the least interesting characters for me. I I agree with that. But that that scene because it also you know it paired the very Nistown style, uh, the tragedy, and then just Eugenides' writing ability, which I find very compelling. Mm-hmm. He's definitely able to create I don't want to say mystery but like intrigue around characters that you care about without giving everything away or without us believing that that's maybe honestly what's happened. Like he, he can create false narratives that we accept oh. in certain instances. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, or it's like, okay, this isn't literally what happened, but it's also what happened. Let's just let's just right, agree right. on that. that exactly. You, you flew off into into the sunset. <laughs> Although let's in, just in agree. His old Cadillac. <laughs> Wait, wait. Who exactly are we talking about right now? The the dad's death. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, Zooming I, across the Michigan Canadian border bridge. Yeah. Because I, that that scene reminds me of the again. suicides as well. Uh, oh no, Gretchen, no. Yeah. No. I, this hasn't done this to me in months, and of course it doesn't now. When we're trying mm-hmm. to do a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Because I was just, for a second, all I could think of was the weirdest character in this book for me. Um, well, not the weirdest, but, like, Zismo. The weirdest. Like, like, the weirdest. What happened I don't know. with this guy? I don't like, know. Nobody I knows. genuinely thought he was dead, and then he comes back as, like, a cult leader. And I just, I don't know, maybe it's because, like, he Jujendis does do such a good job, generally, with his characters. For this to all of a sudden be like, wow, surprise! I was like, <laughs> plot twist. Heck? No, that's that's the one thing I don't understand it. And like, t- when Taylor was here, we talked. Is that that's what we talked about when you yeah. were here, right? We were like, do do. I'm like, was why? That a thing? <laughs> like, did I hallucinate that? <laughs> but no, Desdemona is like, it was Jimmy Zismo who I thought died on the ice, and it's like, what? Bum, bum, bum. When I was looking at the, the character list, I was reminded that the the leader of the the nation of Islam, yeah, Wallace Fard uh, Muhammad, was a real person. Who's like past is very mysterious with like a list of like pseudonyms and like the, the CIA never figured it out and disappeared in the 30s. But I'm like, why is this a thing? I just I felt like that was so that might have been like the nail on the coffin for my like a like, finalized disconnection from this book, because I was just like, this is just so wrong, and it just seems so out of place for Eugenides, having read like, and at that point, about half of that book, and all of the virgin suicides, and I was just like, because it felt so soap opera, and for yeah, no yeah. purpose. It did, yeah. And then he just wanders out again, and that was that. And I was like, why? Why? I feel like that's one of those things that, in editing, someone should have said, "Just, just take it out. Just make it go away." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't man. serve a purpose. I keep maybe like trying to think, <laughs> like maybe it, it's supposed to to play into how we, um, how we feel about our narrator talking about stuff because it's. All of us read it that he died, and then all of a sudden he's back and we're confused. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's right? also personal reinvention. Like, yeah. Zismo dies and comes back as this person, but it just wasn't dealt with in the correct way. And instead of getting mm-hmm. revenge on the guy he thinks is sleeping with his gay wife, he starts a nation of Islam in yeah. Detroit slums. What? It was just like it was so yep. disconnected for something that I mean, if you can say anything about this story, it's that it is a thorough story. There was a lot of thought put into how yeah. generations and times work together, and this was just like, come on, come on, come on, never mind. <laughs> like, it, why? it did seem the most 
out there of all of the things that <laughs> that happened in this book. And that's mm-hmm. saying something. Because, like, <laughs> there's some weird shit in this book. <laughs> I mean, we've already discussed, like, incest and sex work, and if this is the most out-of-place thing in the book, that says so many things. And yet those are two historically very well-established things. Like, you know, when it comes down to it in our cultural narrative, sex work and incest, you know, they're always there. Jimmy Zismo climbing out of the (laughs) river and starting the Nation of Islam does not have the same foundation. (laughs) I don't know. I kind of like to believe in Jimmy Zismo and his 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 ideals. <laughs> the, the, I like him, I like to think that he fell into that river and was climbing out, and you went, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> Just, we know what we're gonna do now. Islam. I mean, the he was baptized. Was not, he was, was baptized in that river, Taylor. They, they don't have baptism. In Islam, <laughs> I don't know. I never did research on Islam. It didn't appeal to me. They definitely um, don't have baptism. They don't have baptism. Well, but the point I mean, still that makes as much sense as the entire plot arc, so I'm willing to go with it. <laughs> he was anti baptized or unbaptized? From reborn. The... You could just say sure. reborn. Yep. Oh, yep. God. That's that's the thing. You know what I found? It's very difficult to talk about a book that you don't remember very well. <laughs> Even when I'm feeding you scenes? Like Links of Even Sausage? Then. Even then, Taylor. Because it's way... Like, that is coupled with me being like, I mean, yeah, it was okay. Like, I, I'm like, try... usually when I talk more, it's when I'm like, mm-hmm. this thing was really interesting and this thing was really interesting and I liked the way these came together. And while this book had that, I no longer have those things to talk about. Well, it seems that me, the one who remembers it best, having such a positive uh, memory of it, like, I, all I'm saying is I'm the one most qualified to, like, pass judgment on this book. Which means oh. it's a good book. No, it <laughs> means that because of course you would remember the most if you thought it was a good book. We already had this discussion. Yes, but I Gretchen, found huge sections of it to be pointless, monotonous, and boring. So of course I'm not going to leave those in my brain. Because you don't remember so many specifics of things you have issues with, it also reduces, you know, the weight. Of, of your complaint. It, just, it means that you can defend yourself more eloquently. Yeah. And is that unimportant? No, it just means you get to listen to yourself talk more, which I know makes you very happy and me very sad. <laughs> As if I need a reason to talk. <laughs> I, I mean, talk. one thing that we haven't touched on unless you touched on it while I was dealing with my internet was the actual transformation of Callie? We like haven't really no, gotten into we Callie haven't. at all. Yeah. So we should probably deal with that because, I mean, that's the actual supposed meat of this book, even though I think I, in the end I was more connected to Desdemona's story. Like, I think I connected more to her um, as as a person because I probably by the time I got to Callie's actual story, Cal and Callie's actual story, I was like, eh, is it ending? Um <laughs> Which is a disservice to Cal, but yeah. Taylor, do you want to talk about it since you remember everything in such detail, Mr. Gretchen would actually seem to be leading into something that she remembered. Oh no, I was just saying that. Um, I thought that again, there was a lot of really interesting things built into it, like the the steps leading from like Cal to Callie was a really interesting take on the story and, like, the immediate, like, oh, maybe I'm a lesbian, like... The obscure object. Yeah. And so just, like, moving forward in time, I thought that it was it was really... In the style of this book, it was like, huh? But at the same time, it was just really well done. That's what I had to say about that. Mm. Uh... Okay, here, here, here were my thoughts on it. Because we were given this huge backstory of everything 
And and I mean, at the beginning, we know that she's intersex. He, she, they, she, Z. He. He. He, he is intersex. He. Um, that's true. Uh, it it kind of for me took the punch out of that whole arc in a way. Part of me wished that that arc had come first and this had sort of gone backwards as, like, we got to watch Callie turn into Cal and then hear why he had to go on this. But at the same time, I don't know if, again, that arc would have as much punch without the lead-up of, like, this is everything. This is the curse that was placed on this family by this one act done by these two people. And it leads down to her. Because I am very much... I hate... I, I talked about this. I hate when we get to see something before we get to see what led to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, knowing at the very beginning that, that our narrator is intersex and this is the story of, of her becoming him um, makes me less engaged in following the steps that that was and that might be why I mm-hmm. was like it was an okay book it was well written but like I, I wasn't like full on attached to it I found it to be rather deliberately vague in what was actually the change and it gave uh, the beginning mm-hmm. was giving information so conservatively which I found kept my uh, interest and as far as your you know, wondering whether giving this at the beginning. I think the Berlin accounts, those very brief things, accomplished mm-hmm. that for me, and I feel like anything longer, like if it was more than just like a few chapters scattered, it would have really been, for me, distracting, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Like it was enough information that I'm connecting these lines, but while we still have a greater story arc moving forward. I, I, mean, I think Michaela put her finger on an issue that was really important to me and my attachment and engagement with this book as well. Because with how long the opening was without Callie Cal like being there, like the whole Desdemona and Lefty thing and how much time was given to that, I wasn't given enough to know why I should care per se, like it felt, I don't know how to explain this, but it felt like it was just trying to make me care about something without telling me why I should care. Could you be more specific? So, like just, go ahead. I, I was thinking about this. Gretchen and I both like are, are both more attached to Desdemona than we were to Calliope in general, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's because We are the type of people who, when we start a book, want to attach to a character. And because the beginning of this book was not about Calliope, she was not the character that we attached to. By the time we got to her story, we already had made, like, personal emotional decisions about the characters in the book. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that arc was less important. And by the time we got to Calliope and her transition to Cal, Desdemona's still there. Yeah. And so, like, there was also that you end up getting, you end up, even though this is Cal's story, you end up spending more time with Desdemona. Mm. So, like, there's that, too, where Cal's actual story comes after and is sandwiched under Desdemona. So, I mean, I agree. We we like to we like to have character stories we can follow, and this didn't, in the end, didn't feel as much like Cal's story as it did as like the full arc of Desdemona's. Right. I I definitely understand where you're coming from, and I I. What I'm going to say in no way is to imply, yes, you have a way of reading it, but here's the right way to. Because <laughs> we, I I don't want to say that. Um, I'm going to preface this also with, I really like Greek mythology. 
not even to say you need this context. I'm saying structurally, because I there are a lot of echoes of Homer with like the repetition of the sing o muse of it, and I really liked that. But I I just got thinking right now. What you were saying reminded me of when they went to see the Minotaur play, Desdemona and Lefty, and like the musical, and they were so angry because it really just focused on the Minotaur itself and not why the Minotaur was born and all of that, how it was just... I, I can't remember the names, but, you know, the king who received the bull from Poseidon to sacrifice, but he decided to keep the bull. And then Poseidon cursed to his wife so that she would desire the bull, so she got Daedalus to build her a bull, sexy bull costume so it will have sex with her. And she birthed this bull baby. And then she's like, fuck, I need to hide this shame. So they build a wall. <laughs> they build the, the labyrinth around the bull. And then the bull's roaming around the labyrinth. And then you have... Who is it? Perse is it per no, it's, it's not Perseus, but it's like... Then you get the whole other generation of stories that then fall into the, the string through the maze and all of that. And everything that leads together and how it's all interlocking... And how you can give one part of the story, but that's not really how they tell stories. Right. And I agree with that to a certain extent, but that's why I was saying, like, I needed something to care about in the beginning, because, like, what you said, like, you had enough vague information in the beginning to, like, be willing to put the pieces together. Like, in terms of Cal in the beginning... And, like, Cal was I... always there, because he had a very very present narrative voice and yes, would absolutely be bringing his personality and experiences into it as you know like the the floating ghost of cal years and years before he was born like let me let me talk to you i don't know but i, don't I didn't know. engage yeah i and Which, maybe you know, that's a thing Maybe it has to do with um, just just the types of readers that we are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Taylor is definitely a very detail-oriented reader. I was target audience. Taylor is target audience. <laughs> I, I, am I am not. I am target audience adjacent, and Gretchen is not target audience. <laughs> So, yes, yeah. um, we're almost, I mean, I guess we're at 50 minutes because we started a little bit late, but um, is there anything else that we want to talk about? Are we okay with this being a little bit shorter? I mean, I think um, we talked about the two halves of the narrative pretty. Mm -hmm. cause, I mean, I think that's like, there's Desdemona, and then there's Cal, and I think that... Oh, okay. So... Go ahead. Here is a thing that we could talk about because this is the revisiting of an author thing. Would you read another Eugenides book, like The Marriage Plot, or are you like, be like, nah, I'm done with it, don't like Eugenides at all? He's batting 500 for me right now, and like I said, with The Virgin Suicides, it's not a book that makes you want to automatically read everything else he's ever written because The Virgin Suicides is such a stab a continuous stabbing of the heart. Um, but at the same time, like, if I saw a book on a shelf and I thought this has an uh, opportunity to be very emotionally impactful and it wasn't, like, this big... Because, mm -hmm. like, The Virgin Suicides is a short book. Yes. yes. Comparatively. So, like, if I saw, like, a short book, I think that that worked really well for him and I would be willing to read that if I felt like I needed to just sob for a while. <laughs> Or think about things. Because he is really good at making you think about things in, like, different or uncomfortable ways. And I appreciate that. But, like, I wouldn't go searching for it. Okay. Taylor? Well, before we went live, you drew my attention to the fact that The Virgin Suicides was his first book. This was his second. And... That would definitely incline me to pick up anything he's written that I happen across. Because I kind of hate him for that. 
Like, some people write a fantastic book as their first, and then they, like, take some time off, and either they never write again, or they turn out some good things, and sometimes it's a bit before they get back into something great. He's just written back-to-back two phenomenal books. Like, even outside of personal preference, he wrote two incredibly unique and ambitious books. Yep. So, I... I don't think I can, in any fairness, say, you know, maybe I'd, I'd do it. <laughs> Look forward soon to Taylor's review of The Marriage Plot. Which I heard was pretty okay. <laughs> yeah, his only other full-length novel is The Marriage Plot. Um, and then it looks like he has a collection of short stories that was published in 2008. Ooh, that could be interesting. That could be. It's called My Mistress's Sparrow is Dead. Great love stories Aww. from Chekhov to Monroe. Wait, that that's his short stories? Or did he compile? Is the entire works of Chekhov and Monroe his? <laughs> no. Hold on, I'm reading the description of it. Okay, because just saying, I would be very interested to see what he would do with the short story medium. I think that would be fascinating. It's actually just three stories, and they're each over 100 pages. <laughs> that would not be shocking to me. <laughs> well, Michaela, this we're waiting on your opinion. This doesn't tell me what this book is. God damn it, the <laughs> Just give us your opinion. Um, it looks like he did write these as short well, stories. No, I mean, would you read more um, of his stuff? You need to answer your own question. Oh, read more <laughs> of Genity's works? Yeah. I, I, I loved The Virgin Suicides. I liked this book. There were things about it that didn't connect with me personally, but that doesn't mean that I didn't recognize everything that he was doing in the writing and that it, it was successful in a lot of the things it was trying to do. And then um, I've heard The Marriage Plot is a divisive book that people either sort of love it or hate it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would read it, and I would That's probably read good. anything he comes out with later. So, yeah. I have nothing against Degenities. I probably won't make us read more of his works as a book club. He doesn't have um, that many more, and uh, it'd be weird. I mean, to listen, read all of if, it. if he uh, is doing short stories, like. I'm on board. I might not enjoy the okay. experience, but I'd be fascinated, like, as an English major analyst to see what he does with that. Maybe that'll be a Christmas special. <laughs> my, my, my mistress's sparrow is dead, a Christmas special. <laughs> it kind of sounds yep. like a holiday song. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, I think that's all of it. You can find us around the interwebs. Our links are already in the description of this video because I am able to do that with Google Hangouts. We have figured out how to make Google Hangouts work again. Thank God. <laughs> we all really need to reread The Subtle Knife because I don't remember it. I never even started reading yep. it. <laughs> but guys, they were in your... They were in your... We creeds for the, yeah, the no. challenge. Oh. Awful. We didn't All read right. it for book two with that. <laughs> in case you were wondering, uh, so are not up to speed, we are supposed to be reading the entire His Dark Material series by Philip Pullman for our Nostalgia Junkie special. Which is um, going to be next week, presumably. Which, God willing, will sometime happen this month. Um, let's be realistic here, <laughs> friends. Uh, and then if you are wondering what our next book for the regular season of this uh, book club will be, it um, will be... A few weeks from now? Yeah, God willing, um, before the month of September. It will be the second book in the Daughter of Smoke and Bones series by Lanny Taylor. We did the first book in the series for our uh, Imbibliomancy special uh, last year, and everybody actually liked it. Yeah. So I yep. I think, I've read the whole series. It's my pick, obviously. Um, and I think that the second book is the best book, so I'm super excited for that. 
So that is Walter Mowers is the thirteen and a half lives of Captain Blue Bear, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> Speaking of, that's huge. It's yeah, it goes really book. quickly though. God willing, we'll do that before December. <laughs> God willing. <laughs> But see, when when if it, it does take us to December, in theory, we're living together at that point, and it would be much easier to do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. So there is that. Um. Yep, that's everything. All right, leave. Guys, everyone, get out. Bye. 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 Go on, get you stupid animal. Can't you see? I don't want you anymore. <laughs>